So Xeno recently introduced asynchronous functions and they are super useful. Uh, and But it can be kind of tricky to figure out how you're going to work with them, uh, especially since there's a lot of functionality that's like, you know, what, what does this stuff really mean? Uh, so I'm going to sort of take you through the TLDR of it, of uh, how to get some good use out of asynchronous functions, how to sort of start thinking asynchronously uh, and thinking in terms of promises, which are a core idea in these asynchronous functions. Let's talk about how to get into this here. We're going to create a function here, and I'm going to call it async test, uh, which is going to be the function we can run from inside uh, an asynchronous context. As we might imagine, we're going to have a function that's going to contain a you know message that's uh, going to get stored here, and we're going to have an integer of you know uh, let's see delay in seconds. Because one of the ideas here is that you want to have something that can run relatively quickly, uh, but that is going to um, uh, but but then can kick things out and then have them come back. But the more important thing, and even I think more exciting way to be making use of asynchronous functions, isn't just a fire and forget. It's going to be having things run in parallel, right? So you can say, I want to have this and this and this and this all fire at the same time. This can be especially important, especially when working with things like, you know, AI requests, which you know are gonna take a little while and you know they're kind of independent of each other and you can have all of your agents run and then come back and then deal with their answers at the end and sort of collect those answers back. And we'll talk about how we do that with await. But you know, let's take a super simple example to start with. And we're going to have a message, we're going to have a delay in seconds. And, the, um, and, and so what we're going to do is, in, is introduce a sleep, right? So we're just introduce an arbitrary pause. And we're going to just use the delay in seconds to see how long it's supposed to sleep. Then we're going to say, let's add another function. We're going to, you know, add uh, to event, uh, let's see, uh, event log. Add event to log. There it is, um, and the um, you know the and, and we're going to just say this is coming from async test, and the message is going to be my message that came in, uh, and have nothing else particularly interesting. This is an event log, like I talk about creating in the um, uh, in, in another video in this series, um, and uh, it's also available uh, through the state change extension. Uh, for, uh, uh, for 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 Xano, where if I can you know import functions and have you know add um, you know add add event to log uh, available to me. Uh, but right now I already have it inside my extension because you know I am a state change member. I intend to use this, and the um, and I can uh, just save this here. Now the idea here is that it's going to sleep for a certain number of seconds. It's going to add the, the event to log, saying this is the thing I just wrote, uh, and then it's going to um, return back. Um, just whatever the initial message was, right? Uh, so if I just do a run and debug of it, I can say my message is hello there. And I can say, give me a delay a second of two. And thing takes about two seconds to run. If I were to, you know, open up my, you know, uh, database over here, uh, I could go find my, you know, log table. I think it's called even long there it is uh, and if i were just to uh sort it by id descending i can find my most recent stuff first and here i can see the hello there right so uh this sort of shows how um i can add an item to the event log and it just shows up in my event log and i know pretty much what happened okay that's great and if i were to say i wanted to say hello there too and i wanted to say that make this wait for five seconds you know, notice that the previous one took about 2.01 seconds. This one will take about, you know, 5.01 seconds or something because it's pretty fast. The idea is I'm just introducing a little bit of delay. This is to simulate what you might do with like an AI call, right? So I can, instead of sleeping here, I could have, I'm gonna go call up an AI uh, endpoint or whatever it might be. And then here you can see this thing took about five seconds, right? So now we've got this, I'm just gonna do a quick publish on it. So it's easy for me to access later. Uh, and I'm now going to make a new function uh, which is going to, in fact, we'll, we'll make an endpoint because this is often a use case for endpoints. Uh, and we will say, let's just go into the API group. Uh, that is test, and I'm going to add an endpoint. And I'm going to say it's a custom endpoint because I love making custom endpoints. And I'm going to call this you know, async test, right? And now I have my async test, and the uh, idea is going to be that I can run these async functions um, and then have them fire off, and I won't have to wait that long for this particular endpoint to go. So I can just call it async test, right? And I get my async test function, uh, which is, you can see I've sort of thought about this kind of thing before. Um, and I'm going to have my message of hello uh, first function, and my delay in second is going to be two. 
save. And then, you know, I can, I can uh, instead of, you see how it's set right now to be synchronous? I can click where it says synchronous here and I can switch it from being synchronous to being async. Now, what synchronous versus async means, basically, am I gonna wait for it? Let's call it async for a second. And we'll say save. And we'll see that even though I told it that I want it to run for, let's make something more extreme, like five seconds, uh, if I do a quick run and debug on it, run, you see it, it takes almost nothing at all. In fact, you also notice that it comes back with something. This is interesting. See, when uh, the return value of an async function is going to be something that looks like a UUID, right? And it's actually the identifier for what we call the promise, which is uh, what the um, what the function is going, it basically is a placeholder, like a little, little storage key, uh, for so that uh, when the function is done, you were able to find out, uh, get the answer uh, from it. And, and, and this is kind of cool, because now what we can do is we can say, let's add a function here, and we're going to, um, you know, say, oh, wait. And in fact, you know, let me, let me follow my own rule here and say that you're going to do this by going down to utility functions. And you're going to find that you can both you can do async function await. Now the neat thing about the async function await is it takes an array of UUIDs. So we're just going to push onto that array the value that came back from func one, which is the UUID thing. And we're going to update this. Note that it's only willing to wait for up to ten seconds right now. We, you can adjust this, but like this is probably something you're going to want to move up northward because the whole reason you're doing this is going to take a little while. And we can say save. And now we can say. Uh, instead, we're going to tell it to tell me about x1, okay? Now, when I run it again, it waits for five seconds, and then gives me this, which is a key value pair of the object that I was waiting for and the function. That came back and 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 the result uh, that came back and of course we remember the async test it returns back what we passed in as the message and in the course of all this has been doing its business of you know putting in first function to the um, in, into the event log so the the this by itself doesn't seem super exciting because all we've done is sort of taken an asynchronous function and turned it synchronous, right? Um, and the uh, but the, the where things get really interesting is going to be where we um, you know, just say, let's, uh, let's clone this. And what if we had two calls? And what if instead of saying this, we said second function and made this delay in seconds two. Now, this is significant because running it for only two seconds versus this one being for five, obviously this one's gonna come back first, right? So the idea behind a wait is it waits for everything that you push in to come back. So if I give it, you know, uh, the second one, in fact, this is one still called func1, which is not going to be that helpful. So let's, let's delete that here. Uh, let's go into this thing that's called func1, da, 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 and we'll call it output. It's going to be func2, okay? We'll skip that. Uh, and the um, and we're going to go into this guy. And we're going to say this guy here, uh, we're going to push func2 in addition to func1. Now, what's going to be neat here is that this thing's going to wait for the full five seconds because this one's going to take five seconds to finish. And even though this one takes two seconds to finish, it's only going to come back when everybody is done. So I can go around again, right? And now we have these two functions, which together would have taken seven seconds, but now only take one. So I'm going to go clone this guy again. I'm going to go rename it and we're going to call it and we'll call it a uh, you know, third function and we'll give it the output name of func3 and we'll further give it the delay of seven seconds okay so the idea here now is i have something that previously would have taken me seven plus five plus two seconds which is 14 seconds right but now it's only going to take as long as the slowest one of these three and i go down to the async function wait i can say you know what we're just going to push on to that you know the uh, func3 as well and this is a pattern you're going to find yourself repeatedly using when you are building these like they come back with an id and you're just going to go push that id onto your wait so we'll say save and you can identify which key goes with which input uh, which can also be a pretty handy thing to do. So l let me uh, sort of build a, a dictionary for, of it, right? So let's say we're going to have, um, and we'll call it, uh, you know, uh, promises. And we'll make it an object, okay? And we're going to say, uh, save that. 
and the and I'm gonna move this up here. See what becomes interesting about this now is I can add another function where I'm just going to do an update variable. And I'm gonna I'm going to update this particular, I'm gonna update promises dot first function to whatever came back from uh, well, actually, this guy's a little bit too tall, too, too high in the stack, isn't that? So I need to just sort of move this down, and then I will go back in, and I'm going to say update promises first function to be whatever func one is, right? That way, the promise gets stored in there, and now I can uh, similar, I can repeat that, and I can say, all right, well, let's uh, clone this, and I'm going to update, you know, dot second function. Uh, actually, this is a third function because it's func three third function, right? And this is going to be func3. I can say save. And then I'm going to uh, do a scan. I'm going to clone it and uh, call this uh, func2. Uh, and I'm going to say this from promises second function. Now, the reason why this, these things are going to be really, really useful to us is that we are collecting all of our results into X1. Uh, but what we might want to do is figure out, well, okay, all these results came back, but, but which one were they supposed to be? I mean, like this thing just has a random key plus second function. How do I know which request it went with and which inputs it was really supposed to go with? And that's the reason why we've been collecting this list of promises is to find out what they are and also to get the data uh, that, um, that, they, that, that goes along uh, with them to find out what their original key was, right? So now what I can do is I can just, I'm gonna iterate over them. And so I'm going to say, let's uh, do a for each, right, um, over the promises, right? And we'll call that promises as a, a promise. In fact, it's not over promises. It's going to be promises because promises is an object. So we actually need to get the keys of that, of that um, right? And that's going to get us first function, second function, third function, promise key. Okay, and we'll say save, and we'll and now because we're inside this, we're going to uh, create a variable, and we're going to get um, promise ID, uh, which is going to be equal to um, promises get based on the promise key. Right, so it's gonna be whatever was in first function, whatever was in second function, whatever is in third function, and then that should return the actual key, the, the UUID looking thing, because that's what we're collecting as we're doing these update variables all the way going down. I'll say that. Now, what's cool about that is because we now know the promise key and we know the promise uh, value, which is, and then, and then the next thing we can get from here is going to be the promise, um, is, is then connect that right with my uh, list that I have inside my async uh, function right which is what what it came back with an object of keys that go with those values so I'll find out what the output was of each of those and the and so, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a uh, let's, uh, let's let's create a variable and the variable name is going to be promise result and the value is going to be equal to uh, x1 because that's my array of promises and I'm going to do a getter on that of whatever the promise ID was update and save that now I know what the result was so for example from the promise of first function the output really should be first space function right and that will and, and that puts me in a position to like collect the outputs of these in a way that actually connects to what my original intents were. Like I know this is supposed to be for first function. So now what I can do, this is this is gonna be the fun part. Uh, I can take that result and I can say let's uh, let's uh, you know update a variable and it's going to be equal to promises. And we're going to do is gonna make it equal to promises. And we're going to set promises dot promise key to that result right we're going to remove that little id that we had uh, sitting in the middle now the idea here is that, that when we kicked it off we got these promise ids but the promise ids aren't that helpful right uh what's going to be helpful is going to be the result of the promise and this then puts it all back together right we're going to have know which thing we asked for goes with which particular answer 
And now we can say, let's uh, tell about promises. Save and let's run again. So let's remember, it's going to take seven seconds or plus because that's the slowest one. And then it's going to stitch the answers all back together. So the first function, second function, third function all come back with the correct answers. Uh, it is interesting that it came back with not knowing what first function was. Uh, makes me think that I did not do that quite uh, correctly here. So promises.first function uh, equals func1, func2, func3. And the uh, and over here at promise ID, promise result, promise promises, ID, promise result is going to be x1.get. In fact, let's just find, let's, uh, let's, in fact, let me add a response here. I'm going to say, all right, let's find out what x1 is. Uh -huh, and I'll say save and save and run again. Okay, so it only ran those second two. Why'd it only run those second two? Funk three, funk two. Ah! <laughs> Well, you can see the problem here, right? They ran func3 twice. So let's have it run func1 instead. Uh, so func1, and we say update that, right? So now it's running func1, func2, and func3, which is, I think, more what we're going for here. And then we can run again, and it will actually run func1, func2, func3. Cool. Now, this also d demonstrates something. I'm, I'm leaving in the, you know, Ray trying to figure out what the heck's going on here, um, because async functions are confusing. Uh, they definitely constitute, you know, one of those hardest five percent type things that I keep on talking about. Um, asynchronicity uh, means you can start using a lot more resource really fast, uh, and of course your Xano box is limited in its scope. And it talks about using these shared resources, but that means it's got shared memory going on, and that is uh, that's all sitting inside this box. And the more of these async functions you run, it's just like running more API endpoints all at the same time, and that might not really give it a great time. That's the reason why when you run async functions like this, you don't want to be running lots of compute intensive functions. You want to be running functions that you're waiting for. And this is where we usually talk about IO block versus compute block. Compute block means we're waiting for the, you know, the CPU to do math. And like if you're doing video games and stuff like that, lots of compute block, right? Lots of animations, lots of, you know, rendering and all that good stuff. But usually what we're waiting for in these situations is somebody else to get back to us. And when we do that, that's where the async functions are really going to pay the bills. So we have, uh, so, so in this case, you know, all I was doing was asleep. But if I were to be, you know, making a call over to a Flowwise API or making a call to, you know, Claude or a call to, you know, whatever. And I keep on mentioning AI stuff because it really is a very common use case I run into uh, that people want to be using these slower AI systems and particularly using them in multiples because we start to use like, you know, multi-agent type approaches in order to get better performance. And getting mastery of this is really worthwhile. You will find that you can do a lot uh, when you are able to kick things off and run them in a reasonable way. You're also going to find that running a few of them in a reasonable way is going to do a lot more for you than running tons and tons and tons of them in a reasonable way. Uh, that, uh, that even this, this is a little bit like the uh, post-process move of um, you, you're kicking things off kind of on demand but uh, you don't really have control over how many of those things are going to fire. This is one reason why I find that these async calls are not best done in, a, a, uh, in API calls, but actually are very good to use in like your background tasks. So that if you have a background task and you want to be running a lot of things through it, uh, you're, if you use async, you can fire off three, five things to all run at the same time, which uh, allows things to go faster through your system. You're not just running them one after another after another. Um, nor are you in a position where you have to kind of do the old school hack, right, of getting them to go fire off in a, um, an API request, right? You can now use async functions directly from background tasks. And that's something I find to be pretty handy because since background tasks are guaranteed to be serial, if you start using the async functions, you might multiply, hey, I'm, so I'm running one thing at a time, I'm running five things at a time. That's under control. When you have API requests coming in, you might get 100 requests all at the same time. And if you start using async functions, you might wind up with 500 actions all going at the same time. And that can be something that starts to bring down your system or requires you to spend a whole lot more money that you didn't really have to spend because you didn't need to have that level of um, a parallelism going on on the on-demand basis. So consider where you're going to use this. You uh, Xano uh, instances do have limited memory uh, and they do have limited CPU. And, the, and deciding how you're going to allocate that is one of the tricks to really getting the most value out of these systems. Uh, and the async functionality is a way for us to be able to cram even more uh, juice out of these things, right? To be getting a better value 
uh, through being able to identify uh, that these are functions uh, that we want to run, that they're going to run in parallel, and that we don't need to wait for you know everything to run one after another after another, but rather be able to take advantage of parallelism because of asynchronicity on the one hand and being able to await these promises at the other. Hope you find this helpful. Uh, we do these kinds of hard things every day over a state change. Uh, and uh, if you have a, a question or a comment, leave it, in the, uh, leave it down below. And if you like this kind of content, please do subscribe because we talk about the hard parts of no code all day long.